Hello. Hi, everyone. Live and direct from a cocoa farm in Sierra Leone and other places around the globe. Um, this is trace talk number six. And um, I think we have a lot of people registered. Uh, probably uh, a lot will turn out to come. So, so let's let's take a while and let them enter the room. Um, in the meantime, for those who are already here, uh, on your right hand side, there's a poll. And uh, please give it a shot. Let us know who you are so we uh, we can see who we're dealing with. Um, I don't have music to uh, play while we do this, but um, maybe as a, as, a, as, a, as a game in between, you can gamble or, or guess what's on the picture behind Ella uh, here. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll share prizes for those who, uh, who have the correct answer. All right. Let's give it one more minute and then we can go. Food companies, non-governmental organizations are winning at the moment. The others are doing uh, well as well. 36% others, 50% NGOs, 15% food companies. Good. All right. Well, I'm sure more will uh, drop in, but uh, let us not uh, waste time because we only have an hour for this trace talk number six, um, organized by Fair Food, or at least moderated by Fair Food, and, and joined uh, by a couple of really interesting speakers. Um, today's theme is fostering inclusive value chains by closing the tech gap. I, to be honest, I, I, I had to look up what fostering exactly means, but it means to encourage development. Well, and that sounds about right. Um, uh, 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 the reason why we're here and why we as Fair Food do this, of course, is because we, uh, as an organization uh, working from the Netherlands, uh, try to um, work for the people behind our food and specifically the smallholder farmers and food workers that put your coffee, your cocoa, your tea uh, in your cup and on your plate. Um, uh, and, and like I said, we're, we're, we're here in Holland, not, not in a cocoa farm, unfortunately. So what, what are our means to, to do our work? And, and of course, that is in, in the digital age, that is technology and data, all that, all that jazz. So, so that led us to develop uh, and, and launch uh, our uh, Trace platform uh, a few years back. And Trace is a, um, a uh, food supply chain mapping and food traceability tool. We'll, we'll talk more about it later. It's not about Trace today. It is about our, our, our colleagues in the field, right? Because uh, technology in general, Trace specifically, it, it, it doesn't operate in a vacuum. We have other uh, uh, initiatives uh, that, that, that work alongside us. And, and today's goal is to learn from those initiatives. Um, and uh, to, 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 to see what other tech uh, is out there to uh, close the gap. And, and, and uh, as a structure for today's webinar, we've used uh, a web World Bank article written or co-authored by, uh, by one of our speakers here, and that laid out a, a, a four main challenges for in inclusive value chains. So, so uh, and, 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 and that's what we use to structure this, uh, this webinar. Uh, first of all, uh, access to finance or, or lack thereof. That's a main challenge to, uh, to, to, to get to inclusive value chains. And then, of course, there are challenges, secondly, with uh, the delivery of goods and services. And that's, that's what we'll have another speaker uh, talk about. As always, as, as, as 
pretty often uh, there are gender inequalities and 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 ella here will will talk about those and and we'll finalize or finish with uh, with derek uh, uh my colleague who'll talk about uh, the the lack of adequate uh, supply chain data so uh, we've used this structure uh to to set up our um a webinar, uh, one speaker per challenge that I just mentioned, and, and while they speak, each 10 minutes, uh, you get the opportunity to ask questions in the chat box uh, on your right-hand side. There's a lot of things happening there already. Uh, my colleague Wanda will, will curate uh, some of the questions for us to handle at the end, uh, and, and the questions that we can't deal with uh, at the moment will uh, will uh, answer in a in a follow-up email so that everyone gets all the answers to all the questions well let's go because i'm already one minute behind schedule and that's not good um as i said four main challenges the first of all the first of which is the lack of access to to financial services and 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 here to talk about th those um is Chrissy Martin Meyer from the Swiss Capacity Building Facility, who will kick it off right now. Thanks, Chrissy. Great. Uh, thank you, Derek. So, hopefully, everyone can hear me and see the slides. Yes. All right. Uh, well, thank you uh, to Fair Food for the invite and to all of the attendees for taking the time, um, especially as we're winding down, uh, getting ready for the holidays. Um, so I'm Chrissy. I am a consultant. I spend uh, much of my time working as the Learning and Insights Manager for the Swiss Capacity Building Facility, or SCBF. And it's, you know, I've been working in this space, this kind of digital financial services space for over a decade now, touching on a lot of different themes and working with a lot of different organizations. So um, it's really fun to, to speak here and, and bring some of those different threads together. So the paper, um, the World Bank paper on digital ID and ag that I worked on with um, a few years back that organized the session. I'll also get to, to show you a slide from a, a guide to digital financial services and agriculture that I worked on when I was a staff member at USAID. And now, of course, um, bringing together some of that experience uh, in this role with SCBF. Uh, so really happy to be here today. Um, so I am gonna talk about three things today. So one, how can financial services make agri-value chains more inclusive? Two, how does SCBF expand access to financial services? So, so what is our model and how do we do that? And then third, I will offer, offer a sample of SCBF partners who are currently working on um, this intersection of technology and making agri-value chains more inclusive. Um, so starting with, as I mentioned, this is an image from this USAID guide on digital financial services and agriculture that uh, we published uh, several years back now, but I think it's still a very relevant, I guess, theory of change for why uh, digital financial services in agriculture. And this image is really meant to say that agri-value chains are, operate in a very complex kind of market ecosystem where there's a lot happening and a lot that needs to happen for a farmer to be successful and to use that business so, to um, grow their livelihoods and uh, you know, ma maintain their resilience. But along the way, some of the roadblocks that the farmer might face uh, can be addressed by having appropriate, affordable, and accessible access to financial services. So for example, um, financial services can help to lower transaction costs. So something as simple as getting goods to market can be very expensive if you don't have access to transport, um, if there's a lot of middlemen involved, that raise those costs, right? And so financial services can come in. We'll hear a bit more about that later. Um, climate is clearly a roadblock that is becoming more and more relevant. So climate um, uncertainty, uh, floods and droughts can be a huge setback. And so uh, climate resilient insurance can be really important, have an important way to um, role to play. Um, savings, of course, is also a, a really important thing to have a secure place to save to make longer term investments in those businesses. And unfortunately, though, this gap is, is very large in access to finance. Um, I only have statistics on financing in terms of credit, unfortunately, uh, not in terms of insurance and, and, and uh, savings. 
But in 2016, uh, there was a, a robust study done that showed that the gap is between actually 50 billion and 270 billion. And so 50 billion is the amount of financing that's available to smallholder farmers and 270 is what was at the time estimated to be the need, um, particularly in emerging markets. So Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa and South and Southeast Asia. Um, my guess is that it's, it's bigger now today. Um, and agriculture insurance reached just 10% of smallholder farmers um, and fewer than 15 actually had access to a formal savings account when they did that study in 2016. And so uh, the role of technology is really, uh, is, was really significant in finding new and innovative ways to address these very large gaps. And so how does SCBF um, help to address some of these gaps in financial services? So we recently celebrated our 10 year anniversary. So SCBF uh, was founded in 2011. And since that time, uh, we've worked with 110 different financial institutions within local markets to reach 2.6 million clients. And 68% of those end clients have been women. And so there's been a real intentionality to reaching women because there is such a large gender gap, um, which we will hear about in a bit, I believe. A lot of uh, SCBS focus has been on increasing access to insurance, credit, and financial literacy. And our model is really about uh, bringing together expertise from the public sector and the private sector. Uh, so we work a lot with the Swiss Development Corporation, SDC, and SCBF actually maintains a very low organizational footprint, it has a small secretariat here in Switzerland. Uh, and so we, rather than relying on building out a big organizational infrastructure, we bring together um, resources and knowledge and networks from a wide variety of private sector partners. So we have a large member network which includes many world-class companies like Allianz and Zurich, um, as well as um, impact investors and uh, incubators and accelerators and fintechs as well. And so we combine that private sector expertise with that public sector resources to, uh, to drive results for the part local financial institutions. Uh, these financial institutions uh, are really the key because they have the relationship with the end client. And one of the things that's very important to SCBF is making sure that any technical assistance that we support will be sustainable and really create change at the operational level. And so the partner financial institutions contribute at least 20% of the resources for any project and actually on average contribute 35%. So what are some of the project highlights? How are our partners actually using technology to close these gaps? So I'll first speak about a warehousing financing project in Uganda, which we are working on with Venture South International and Venture South Uganda. And the idea here is to provide financing based on um, warehouse inventory as collateral. And so this helps to lower those transaction costs that we heard about earlier. And so by allowing farmers to use the, their, their warehouse inventory as collateral, they can get funds much quicker than if they actually had to wait until those, uh, that inventory went to market. And so this improves cash flow and provides working capital at the right moment. And it really, uh, the, our partners are, are working on developing through the help of technology, lower cost loans so that they can get loans between 5,000 and 30,000 US dollars um, which is far less than a typical commercial bank in Uganda would offer. The second project I wanted to highlight is also with Venture South International and uh, a few local companies in Tanzania that are offering solar water pumps. And so many of us have maybe heard about Pago lights, household lights has been a big industry in the past few years. And this is bringing that same idea to water pumps to allow um, financing for those water pumps uh, that's mobile money enabled. So the SIM card is actually embedded in those um, climate friendly water pumps, which lowers the risk for uh, the financial institution and lowers the cost for the consumer because it's much easier to turn off the the pump remotely than to send out a person and pay for transport and staff time uh, to check on whether or not the, the client is going to pay. Uh, so moving on, I wanted to spend a few maybe extra minutes um, in my final 
slide here on one of our projects that we think is maybe one of the more innovative or kind of different models. So this is tech-driven post-harvest financing in Indonesia. Um, and so SCBF is partnering with two companies here in Indonesia. So one is Sourbox here in the middle, which is an ag off-taker and a direct-to-consumer organic food company um, that buys produce directly from farmers who deliver that produce to the warehouse. Um, but they can't actually pay the farmer immediately because they haven't necessarily sold it to the customer and gotten all the money. And so uh, they partnered with Our Tanai to, to deliver a loan immediately within 24 hours. So after the, the, the initial due diligence is done, the loans are delivered within 24 hours directly to the farmer. Um, this is through a smartphone application where they, the farmer actually signs the contract and receives the funds. And the idea here is that the farmer gets that, that money quicker and they're building up a credit history, which will help them to access funds um, in the future. The, the loans are offered at 0% interest um, because the technology is reducing the cost so much and uh, Sourbox is uh, offering that, so covering the interest on the margin. And Sourbox actually pays the loan dry, directly back to Our and Tanai so that the farmer doesn't have to worry about repayment. This reduces warehouse wastage from around 30% to closer to 5% um, because we're, there's just more and better information within the supply chain. And uh, you know, I think through this pilot, what's, what SCBF is supporting is the ability for our and Tanai to really perfect this data science, this data-driven algorithm that's specific to farmers. Uh, you know, they, they've done this before with small shops in Indonesia. They're doing it again with farmers, but they don't have the track record yet to go to a commercial bank and access the kind of large amounts of financing that they will need to scale this model. So SCBF support really comes in at this very critical moment um, where they have the good idea, they have partners, they have some customers and they have the platform, but they don't have the track record that they need to go to a commercial investor or even an impact investor. This is called the pioneer gap. It's where a lot of startups fail um, when they, they just can't quite get uh, the, uh, enough traction to get to that commercial investment. And this is a key area where SCBF can come in and support. Um, so I will wrap up there, but I look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Chrissy. Uh, yeah, questions are coming in. Um, uh, um, we will handle questions at the end. Uh, but I see your 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 yeah. This is a broad spectrum you're covering. Uh, very interesting to to have heard you uh, describe some of these examples. Um, let us let us move forward with um, um, with Alfred Alfred Jaboa from the uh, Grameen Foundation, who uh, talked with us about the, a solution to optimize the delivery of goods and services. Go ahead, Alfred. Yeah, so thank you so much. Uh, my, my presentation will be on optimizing service delivery in a data-driven uh, agribusiness ecosystem. So I would want to start by highlighting Grameen's work and signature programs uh, using this infographic. Uh, the flow diagram shows our two-way solution of enabling our community agent networks with tools along with data as part of facilitating the impact in our digital financial services and agriculture work. The focus of my presentation, however, will be on two select Grameen digital farming programs, the technologies used to capture data and how that data is applied for the benefit of small scale farmers and the different service providers that serve them. I will start with the FarmerLink open data platform developed in the Philippines. It may interest you to know that despite being part of a multi-billion export industry, coconut smallholder farmers are some of the poorest with about 60% actually living at or below the poverty line globally with an annual income of around just 440, $440. Definitely, this narrative needs to change. How then 
are we tackling this problem? So Grameen worked with a strategic alliance of partners to develop the former link suite of mobile extension tools that worked in an integrated fashion to help coconuts more strengthen their businesses, build resilience, and also mitigate you know, losses due to climate change. Together with our partners, we combine the power of mobile technology and human networks to help these farmers improve productivity, provide them access to appropriate financial services, and then directly link them to markets and reduce their losses to pests and diseases. So what are the key features of the FarmerLink platform? It works offline to enable field agents to capture you know, data on farmers and link professionally and meaningfully to their producer groups, suppliers, and financiers. What is unique about this connection of farmers to these groups is that it puts farmers in control over how their data is used, as well as giving them an increased stake in the governance and decision-making of the use of FarmerLink. It is the farmer that decides whether and which data to share with suppliers and financiers through data exchange with suppliers or financiers through APIs and other means. So the data collected on a farmer includes socioeconomic, farm location, and productivity information. Other important data collected by the far field agent are the farmer's total production levels, volume sold, and who her customers are. In addition, farmer practices in the field are captured and checked for compliance with a specific farm management plan. For example, what type of fertilizer do they apply and in what quantities? What is unique here is that a quick feedback is provided on adoption levels to the farmer and added to his or her farmer profile. The data collected are then consolidated into reports for suppliers and other direct insight and analysis through dashboards that are customized based on key performance indicators. It, it also provides an overview of field performance comparing actual versus targets. The farmers are able to also assess financial services given that rural banks are able to identify target clients as they gain more visibility into their activities based on data. Farmers are also engaged with SMS campaign containing good agriculture practices and cash management practices. There is an early warning system that also triggers alerts on weather conditions and potential pest and disease outbreak using weather and farm level data. The field agent who works with a farmer uh, also visits them regularly to help them with their finances, track their productivity, and provide them options on how they can best manage their farms. So, you know, based on some lessons learned from deploying the FarmerLink platform in the Philippines, Grameen and Partners then designed the Digital Farm Grow application, which is a more robust, you know, uh, decision-making tool for smallholder cocoa or cacao farmers in Indonesia, Ghana, and Cote d'Ivoire. The uniqueness of the Digital Farm Grow solution actually lies in the transformative aspects of the digitalized data as related to data extraction and analysis. The Farm Grow algorithm also takes into consideration usability of relevant data for personalization, customization, and also better monitoring at the farm level. For value chain players, the Farm Grow generates aggregate data to enhance business decision making in areas such as, let's say, resource deployment or even farmer engagement. And with the help of farmer profiles, businesses and suppliers gain insight into each farmer's capabilities or capacities, needs, and aspirations. So there are four key steps you know, involved in the farm growth process. The very first step is for the field agent to profile the entire farming household and this slide shows the field agent using the tool to create an accurate socio-economic and productive profile of a farming household. The field agent then proceeds to collect farm level data that is analyzed using a smart logic to allow for personalized farm plans that guide farming households to plan ahead and also to better 
manage costs and financing of their farming operation. So pictured in this slide is Selaxi, one of our agents who is demonstrating, demonstrating soil health assessment to farmers. This graph shows the aggregated results data for various variables assessed on the farm. It also shows, for example, that pruning and fertilizer application are relatively bad, which is shown in blue bar, with harvesting and application of organic matter relatively in good status. Based on the digital farm profile and results data of the farm assessment, a specific farm plan is developed. So what is in this farm plan? The farmer can see the plot level recommendations to follow to increase productivity, how much investment they need to make, and whether or not there will be a resultant profit or loss for them when they adopt a good agriculture practice. Basically, it shows a return on investment for the farmer. This slide shows a visual presentation of key practices that a farmer needs to follow within, let's say, a decade, 10 years, to increase crop productivity and then the financial investment they need to make. We believe that by combining the power of technology and trusted human networks, we are able to help farmers increase their productivity through in-depth coaching sessions using the two. And Farm Grow basically seeks to triple yields of cocoa farms from 400 to 1,500 kilograms per hectare. So my last slide provides some reflections on enabling a data-driven agribusiness ecosystem. First, Person-to-person -person support is still necessary to build trust and bring farmers into the digital ecosystem. We need to put a human component at the center of technology-enabled programs by building field agents' capacity to be able to use technology as a tool for effective extension and training. Also, service providers and farmers should not treat data as just a resource, but as an asset, and should consider opportunities to monetize data. Small so farmer data is giving rise to new configurations within service provider business models. In fact, most of the data and the technology already exist to solve many of the constraints that farmers face. But the solutions are fragmented, and not all service providers or farmers have equal opportunities to access them. Big data is promising to bring these fragmented data, resources, and service providers together in an agribusiness ecosystem. Thank you so much. Thanks, Alfred. Um, nice to see uh, uh, cocoa pods uh, and, and, and coconuts uh, come by. That, that makes me feel at home. Um, and yeah, data, not only as a resource, but as a valuable commodity that can be monetized, eh? potentially by farmers. That, 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 that'd be a thing. Um, again, uh, questions come in. Uh, we'll, we'll treat them later. Um, let's, let's move on. Um, Time is pressing. Um, Ella, may I invite you to uh, to uh, uh, yeah shed light on on a solution to reduce gender inequality that you've been working on? Yeah, sure. And thank you so much for inviting me to talk about how we've been supporting uh, women in global supply chains at her project, and how we're increasing their financial and digital inclusion through technology. So globally, um, around 230 million adults receive their private sector wages in cash, which is challenging for many reasons. You know, cash wages are really inefficient. They're risky for employers and workers. And every month that cash has to be transported from the bank out to the farms or the industrial areas, counted out for however many workers um, there are, and then distributed to each worker, which process can um, you know, it's be very lengthy. Um, on payday, workers go home with a full month's wages um, on cash in them, which is not very safe, especially for women. Uh, you know, in most places, everybody knows when it's payday. And it's also very disempowering for women who have less control over their wages when they're paid in cash, which are easier to hand over or be taken from them. So wage digitization in global supply chains represents an opportunity to increase financial and digital technology inclusion for women. Um, and we've been working at her project with the Bill and Bill Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation since 2015 to pilot digital wages in Bangladesh. We focused on the garment sector in our pilots. However, the learning and the tools are applicable and transferable across agricultural value chains too. And that's um, a sector that we're going to be um, working with next. And so through this pilot, 
um, we worked with 70 factories to digitise their wages, which led to over 150,000 workers, the majority of which were women, to be paid into accounts. And this led to benefits for both business and for women. So for business, um, there's an increase in payroll efficiency. Admin time that factory managers spent on payroll each month fell by more than half. Worker production time lost on payday fell by three quarters. And given that time is money in factories, this is very important. It also increases transparency and compliance. Managers found it easier to pay workers on time and to have a transparent record of who was paid what and when. And this also contributes towards global buyers' social and labour compliance requirements. And certainly wage digitisation is becoming more important to their sourcing and purchasing process strategies. But importantly, um, and especially for her project, it's got benefits for workers, especially for women who make up the majority of garment workers. It increases their financial inclusion and access to digital financial services because for the majority of workers, they're unbanked. And so this is their first financial account. And following the training, they we see them become active mobile money users. You know, the women are conducting around eight transactions a month. The men are conducting 13. So there's, you know, slightly more. There is a gender gap there. But still, they're all becoming active users and they're not just withdrawing 100 percent of their wages on payday, um, but withdrawing money when they need it using their accounts to send money to their families and topping up airtime, which are financial services that are really important to them. We also see an increase in financial resilience. So one in five workers, both men and women, started saving regularly, um, including because they had somewhere safe to keep the money in their new bank accounts, rather than having you know, cash at home under the mattress, uh, which is not so safe. Um, and we also found, because we had um, have focus on this, that one in five women started making joint financial decision making joint financial decisions with their families, which is really significant in a country like Bangladesh, where women are often handed to, expected to hand over their wages to a male family member. Um, so pictured here, this is Pushpa. Um, she works for a Marks and Spencer supplier in Dhaka, and I met her in November 2019, pre-COVID, uh, when it was possible to travel. Um, and Pushpa told me that before wage digitization, she was really nervous about it. However, once it had taken place, she actually really prefers it because when she was paid in cash, she just didn't feel safe on payday. She'd often have to pay to get a rickshaw home instead of walking. And, you know, she's a migrant worker um, and it was really important to her to send money home to her parents in the village. And to do that, you know, maybe after work, she had to go to an agent and join a queue that was surrounded. And she'd be surrounded by men and she'd feel quite uncomfortable. And especially when she had to say to the agent what her phone number was as part of sending the remittance. Um, sometimes she'd get dodgy calls late at night, uh, which is obviously very unpleasant for her. But now that she knows how to use uh, mobile money, she is able to send that through her account and she doesn't have to go through that anymore. And Pushpa also told her friends and sisters about the benefits and helped them to open accounts too. So actually, um, some research by Intermedia showed that thanks to this ripple effect from workers like Pushpa sharing with others, uh, women who live in communities that surround garment factories but are not garment workers themselves are two and a half times more likely to become active mobile money account users. So it's a really uh, multiplying the impact of the uh, waste digitization. But of course, um, there are challenges um, which need to be addressed at worker, factory and also ecosystem level. So um, for workers, um, they have low levels of financial capability and they are unbanked. And they don't have the knowledge and the skills and the confidence to be able to use financial services. So the financial capability training is very important um, because, um, you know, they may lack the basic familiarity with the technology and may have developed a distrust of digital products. Gender barriers, um, you know, it's really important to think about women's needs during wage digitization to help them to access and use and ultimately, ultimately benefit from their payroll accounts. So, for example, women are less likely than men to have the, um, the, the documents needed to open accounts. They might not have a SIM card that's registered in their own name, and they're more likely to have a feature phone than a smartphone. So all of these things need to be considered. We also know that women um, may be expected to hand over their wages uh, to male family members. 
Um, and therefore, they might have been hiding some of their wages as part of a coping mechanism for, around this. Um, and therefore, when they're paid digitally and perhaps might receive uh, an SMS message saying how much they've been paid, that could expose that they have been doing that. So it's really important to understand, um, you know, the financial needs of women to avoid any unintended consequences. Also, uh, barriers for employers, um, you know, there's a reason why they've been paying cash wages. They don't have the experience of paying digital wages. So it's really important um, to provide the support for them. One of our key recommendations is to take things slowly, have enough time to consult workers about the change and reassure them and to stagger any changes. You know, payroll is such an important thing for all of us. Um, and so by uh, you know, starting with smaller groups, any issues that arise can be identified and addressed rather than with the whole factory. Uh, for example, demand on cashing out on payday um, could be one, uh, one issue. And then for the wider ecosystem, for example, for financial service industry, it's really important for them to understand the financial needs of male and female workers so they can develop uh, and promote appropriate, relevant and affordable products for them that can be used on the devices that they have access to and to be able to make digital payments that are relevant for them. Um, and, you know, collaboration is really important to address these barriers. As I said, there's 230 million workers who are paid cash wages. So no one organisation can tackle that alone. And we work with um, a range of key stakeholders to to share our insights, to learn from them and to help, um, you know, together um, to work towards a thriving, sustainable digital wages ecosystem. Um, that will benefit both um, employers and workers. Um, um, especially women. And then finally, I just wanted to share um, how we use technology tools to help close the, the technology gap for workers and facilitate that transition to digital wages at, at scale. So we've developed a tech learning tool, which you can see um, pictured here, uh, which is a gamified app that's used on tablets. Um, and it's helped uh, uh, helps to increase digital literacy as well as providing really engaging information about financial services and financial capability. And we developed uh, this with Quizar and um, we have videos and animation and then quizzes as well. Um, and the workers have responded really well to it. And for many of them, um, it's the first time using a touch screen. You know, the majority are, are, of women in Bangladesh, if they have a phone, it's more likely to be a feature phone. And they can be really scared about touching it for the first time. They think that they might break it. And so this is also improving their digital literacy. Um, and in this picture, this is again, this is, uh, this is from February uh, 2020. So just before COVID, they were using the tablet in groups of five. Uh, but now now um, we're using it in um, with pairs and they do sit slightly further apart from each other. Um, and, you know, we also have um, a whole range of tools. We have videos, we have uh, songs that can be played on a PA. We've got a series of posters. So all of that, as well as our training, uh, means that there's multiple different ways that workers, um, particularly women, can get information, which really helps to reinforce the message. Um, so that they can really help them to be able to um, use their uh, new accounts with confidence. And overall, we found that gender responsive wage digitization is a really effective and scalable way to support inclusion in value chains and to help close the tech gap for female workers. So I'm going to stop here, but please do add any questions in the chat um, or you can reach out to me. Thank you so much, Ella. That, that is really encouraging, right? Uh, first, uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you had to go through probably uh, a husband, an uncle, uh, a, a man to get to the bank, get your ID, uh, be paid. And now uh, the threshold has become so much lower that it also opens up a whole new can of worms, uh, uh, of course, uh, yeah, but, but, it, but it gets uh, easier and easier. This is great. Um, uh answers afterwards uh derek um keep it short keep it sweet uh how do we work at fairfoot because derek is my colleague um uh, on a solution to provide adequate supply chain traceability thanks martin feeling uh, super inspired from all these stories uh my name is derek i'm a solutions architect uh oops are we 
starting? No, there we go. Sorry. My name is Derek. I'm a solutions architect here at Fairfood. Uh, today, I want to talk a little bit about an app we've recently developed, but more importantly, I'd like to give a concrete example of uh, how we use inclusive design when creating tech solutions. So I think anyone that's been in a supermarket recently can, can, can see that it's undeniable that storytelling and, and product claims are, are really on the rise. Um, this is uh, getting much broader and deeper than just the everything is fine stamp from certification schemes. So really seeing full traceability and detailed storytelling. Of course, this is not just on pack, but also in social media and corporate social responsibility reports. And of course, in, in business to business sales that require responsible sourcing. Uh, sometimes these are quite detailed and nuanced claims, which is wonderful. Uh, and the rise of technology really, uh, really is making this possible. Um, at the same time, that means that there's more and more requests from farmers for data. Um, this is often done for really good reasons. Like I said, full transparency and brands and consumers learning more about farmers and the challenges at origin. There's, of course, lots of uh, projects that are searching for ways to compensate farmers better or increase yields or quality, et cetera. Um, and so by definition, farmers are being included. Uh, but are, is this really inclusive? Is this an inclusive way of collecting this data? Uh, if you talk with farmers, you hear a lot about data or survey fatigue. It's not clear why data is being collected or, or what the benefit will be for them. Uh, and Fairfood, by nature of providing a, a traceability and mapping and storytelling tool, is, is of course in the data collection space. Uh, and I think it's important to mention that data collection in the field is, is often tough. There's lots of challenges when we talk about substantiating claims uh, on the ground. So uh, a kind of starting principle for us is that claims about farmers should come with evidence, good evidence from the source. Uh, and when we look around for solutions, we see a lot of field data collection tools. There, there's many of them. None were exactly fitting our purposes, but more importantly, none were really designed or not many we were seeing were designed in an inclusive way. Um, just asking more data from farmers. Um, some, were, some were designed in inclusively, but maybe impractical, requiring farmers to have extensive training or a smartphone, uh, which is great in some contexts, but, but maybe not in all, uh, if you think about smallholder farmers. Uh, and so we, of course, started to think about uh, designing our own tool. Um, but before doing that, we really zoomed out a little bit uh, to, 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 to think about an inclusive design perspective. What would an inclusive solution look like? Um, we think that farmers should be given an active role in data collection. So they should know when and why claims are being made. They should give consent. Um, they should participate in verifying these claims and know how data is going to be used. Um, we also think they should be compensated. Uh, presumably, value is being added by uh, through these claims and by uh, storytelling. And so farmers should also share in that benefit. Uh, and to put it bluntly, uh, one of the most important components of farmer inclusion that's missing is, is financial inclusion. Um, we also think that farmers should be given control. They should be able to opt out. They should be able to signal issues with, with, with data, incorrect data or data quality issues. And of course, they should be able to access their own data and, and, and use it for their own purposes. Uh, and last but not least, I think farmers should be given a sense of pride that, that people far away care about and enjoy the product that they're delivering and are interested in the, in the who and where around the product. Um, there's some additional design principles. Of course, uh, this shouldn't be an extra burden for farmers or, or as little as possible. Uh, it should fit the local context. For example, do farmers have smartphones or, or feature phones? Uh, are they paid in cash? Uh, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, it should also, we shouldn't get in the way if our, if our project is not working. It should just be business as usual. And finally, we should really co-create this with farmers. We, we should get as much feedback from farmers in the field when designing a solution as, as possible. Uh, so we built an app. Uh, this is the Trace Collector app. Uh, it's, it's given to those who are really collecting or receiving product uh, in the field. So this can be buyers or cooperative uh, uh, storage uh, employees or people that are doing processing at a cooperative, not for farmers. Um, buyers use this app to register their transactions with farmers, including important details about the transaction. So uh, uh, who, what, where, uh, how much, uh, what, what were they paid, what the quality is, this kind of stuff. Um, it's designed very simply. Uh, it's designed to work offline, uh, so even in remote uh, areas with limited connectivity, uh, and will, of course, sync when the phone's online again. Um, 
Farmers, for their part, are given NFC cards. Uh, you could think about these as kind of the, the door access cards you might be used to get into a building or by tap to pay uh, debit cards. Um, these cards have some information uh, on the card. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, farmers uh, are informed about the project. They're told that customers and the rest of the value chain want to know about who makes the product, uh, to, that a premium was paid, for example, uh, and have them verify that this is the case. Um, they're asked if they would like to participate and informed about how it's, it's going to work. Again, farmers don't need a phone in this scheme. If they have one, that's excellent, whether that's a smartphone or a feature phone, that, 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 that I'll talk about that later, uh, but they don't need one. Uh, so the process. Well, actually, for the farmer, the process is the same as normal. Uh, the farmer simply brings his product uh, to a collector or, 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 or the collector comes and visits him and he sells it as, as usual and gets paid uh, in cash uh, as usual. Um, the buyer is the one that's responsible for entering these uh, transaction details uh, in the app. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the transaction with premiums uh, are, are kind of registered in, in, in the app. Um, the app then creates a kind of digital payment slip, which clearly states what the farmer should have received. Uh, the farmer checks this receipt and verifies by simply tapping his card. Uh, if he forgot to bring his card, no problem. We have a fallback method. Uh, it's possible to make a paper receipt uh, kind of the traditional way, have the farmer sign it and take a photo of it. Uh, again, this works offline, uh, no problem. Uh, and of course, the data will flow with a product through the supply chain. Uh, So I mentioned earlier that there was some, some, some information on the car. There's a QR code and a link and also a local telephone number. Uh, if the farmer does have access to a smartphone either themselves or through a neighbor, uh, that's great. They can access a kind of uh, mobile website. Uh, if they don't, no problem. They can use send a message to a, a local number. Uh, and in this way, farmers are given access to their own data, uh, whether or not they have a smartphone. This is basically a digital delivery history, quality, and payment history. Uh, farmers can, uh, of course, also opt out of sharing their personal information with others in the supply chain, in which case we're working to anonymize the data as it moves through the chain. Um, and beyond being kind of only fair, we really see potential in how this could be used by the farmer. Um, this, of course, is better than having a pile of receipts in a drawer somewhere. Uh, and we think that having a detailed delivery and quality history could really give better access to markets or access to finance for the farmer. You can imagine that a farmer having a tr proven track record that's backed up by the supply chain could be useful. Um, oh, I'm supposed to have a nice photo of a farmer here using the app. Uh, something went wrong there. But just to recap, um, we're currently piloting this with Versteja for nutmeg farmers in Indonesia. Uh, Versteja has been really wonderful in both co-sponsoring and co-designing this. Um, these nutmeg farmers are receiving both a quality premium for the product and a data premium for their active role in, in participating. Uh, so far, we see that farmers are really enthusiastic. The card usage is really high. They're really bringing it with them when they make a delivery. We also see a, a large amount of pride uh, in both having the card and participating. Uh, many farmers really want to have their photo taken when they're registered, uh, even though that's, of course, totally optional. Uh, uh, farmers, uh, some farmers are also accessing their own data and we think that's going to ramp up. Uh, one really interesting factor is that the local buyers and suppliers are also really interested. Um, not only are they happy that their farmers are, enth are enthusiastic, but it also helps with their administration as well, um, which is traditionally done with, you know, paper receipts, a log book, an Excel sheet. So we really get better quality data uh, in an easier way. Um, that makes it kind of a win for farmers and a win for these, these buyers, uh, as well, of course, for brands and consumers. Um, we still need to pilot this with more farmers in uh, different commodities and regions, but we're really optimistic about how this is going. Um, we also think that knowing who your farmers are and, and giving them this digital identity enables a lot of new possibilities in the future or, or, or could. Um, we think that asking some on-the-spot questions at the moment of sale could give supply chains more real-time info uh, from farmers about a harvest um, that they could also be compensated for. Um, this solution is blockchain-based, so there's really a potential for more direct forms of payment to farmers. Um, we also think that farmers could be offered more targeted trainings based on real needs, based on the data that's collected at the point of sale. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, I hope you find this interesting. Uh, of course, in, in, in addition to just showing uh, uh, our solution, um, I think the main takeaway is that really thinking about inclusivity when trying to solve problems is not only kind of the fair thing to do, but also really leads to better solutions that have a, have a higher chance of success. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Derek. Um, and, 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 and like you, I'm, 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 I'm so excited to see uh, data come in from the field every day. Uh, this, is, this is just the beginning for us uh, uh, in terms of, of putting tech in the hands of farmers. Uh, but uh, yeah, this, is, this opens up a whole route uh, that we'll be walking on for, for years to come. Um, Ten minutes left, guys. Uh, I promised you questions. Um, Chrissy, you've answered uh, some of the questions in chat already, but I had one burning one. Um, as your article was uh, the basis of the structure of this webinar, and it, it laid out four challenges um, in 2018, um, if you would have written that article again now, would, 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 would you have added or removed challenges, or, or, or what, what would have been different there? You're putting me on the spot. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the sun has also gone down, so my lighting got worse. Um, I that is a great question. I mean, listening to the speakers today, I do think, you know, we. I, I don't know. I I I was going to say reaching women, but that was one of them. So I would. I mean, the paper was structured around identity, and so these were were challenges that we thought that digital ID could solve. And so I guess one. But in a in a different context, I think we could have had a speaker specifically on ID, right? So um, we didn't. I think the new challenges arising are how do we identify everyone, including farmers, and how do we do that really in a secure way, um, which is really such a a big question that I I don't think that um, anybody has really answered to that really that question of. We talked a little bit about it today with Alfred's talk on like that. How do you have farmers own their own data? And I think that that is yeah. extrapolated to how do you own your own identity? Um, how do you allow for really better consent mechanisms? So there's a lot there um, that I think was kind of uh, embedded in the paper being a digital ID paper, um, but could clearly be a challenge in and of itself. So. Yeah. Yeah, we've heard a lot about uh, the problems with identities, right? The, the the Facebook trials, Amazon, Google. It's it's maybe that would have been it. It's clearly written as the the common denominator in your article, and I and I wish we we had more time to really deep dive deeper on that subject, identities, data governance. But uh, thank you so much for for your answers and your structure. Um, um, Alfred, uh, uh, we had a we had a, a, a participant ask, um, what are the advantages of of focusing uh, uh, farm link farm grow on individual farmers versus uh, groups or or even co-ops? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So uh, our approach is more towards segmenting farmers based on their specific needs. So there are aspects of the training that are provided to farmers in groups based on their needs. That is based on the segmentation and clustering that we do right from the beginning of the program. But then there are specific needs that needs to be addressed at the each farmer level. So that is where field agents follow up to the farming household and to the farms of specific farmers to make sure that those needs are being met. But uh, uh, to conclude, I'll say that it is a group approach with an individual farming household touch to it. Thank you. And not all farmers are uh, functionally organized in groups or co-ops, right? Uh, in the end, we're, we're individuals in any case. But thank you. Um, uh, Ella, uh, two questions. Um, uh, you also answered uh, uh, user questions before, but what I wanted to know is, uh, could we, could you estimate what percentage growth in, in female uh, uh, banking access is achievable through through technologies such as uh, her finance. I mean, before uh, 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 women, uh, so many women were 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 banked, and now, uh, what what are the, what are we talking about? 
Yes, yeah, so the potential is huge. Um, if we think of, if we just look at the garment sector in Bangladesh, there's four million workers, of which 58% are women. So that's something like 2.3 million workers. Uh, sorry, 2.3 million women um, that could uh, become banked for the very first time um, simply through wage digitization. And because wage digitization is uh, the business benefits from it, it becomes a sustainable intervention. And so then they continue. Um, to to use those accounts. Now, if we think about that across the all global supply chains, there's uh, 230 million workers um, who are paid cash wages. Um, the opportunity is huge. Those are the numbers where they'll make a dent in this system, huh? Um, thank you, Ella. And the second question: Who's on the picture behind you? <laughs> It's the a swimming problem. elephant in the Andaman Islands. <laughs> it's hard to see now because it's dark. <laughs> it's it's Ranjan, the swimming elephant. <laughs> Nobody guessed, so I'm going to eat the chocolate bar myself. Um, Derek, NFC cards. You still can you can still forget them, right? And 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 farmers do. Can, is DNA, uh, bio, uh, biometrics, uh, is, that, is that the next stop for us? Well, obviously there's some, there's some quite, a, uh, there's already problems with uh, collecting data, right? There's really, I think, uh, value chains and brands really need to think a little bit more actively about what type of data that they're collecting. Um, already quite, there's quite some overreach in data collection that you hear about uh, frequently. Uh, and, and I have my own personal concerns about how uh, some of that data can be stored, um, uh, especially when you look uh, to new rules in place, uh, such as the GDPR in Europe. Uh, I, so I don't necessarily see DNA uh, testing uh, for farmer deliveries happening anytime soon. Uh, but what, what can be said is there are quite some uh, great projects out there that involve uh, fingerprint scanning. Um, uh, 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 in order to verify data. That's really something that the farmer always has with them. Um, uh, we have piloted in the past also cell phone usage uh, uh, that, that went quite well, but of course, uh, in a lot of different contexts, um, uh, verifying a payment uh, or a transaction via SMS um, uh, can be problematic if farmers uh, are sharing their phone or having multiple SIM cards, which is the case in many local contexts. So. Yeah. Um, I think that we really need a multitude of approach uh, in order to really include farmers uh, uh, in this space. And I think that we also will see, uh, as time goes on, far more and more farmers have uh, persistent internet connections and, 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 and an even more active role in, the, in, 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 in verifying data. Thanks, man. Um, guys, it, it, if, if you would have time, uh, diving into identities data governance uh, which 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 everything comes down to uh, would have been would have been really interesting we don't have time and maybe here maybe an afterburner um uh, this group alone uh, uh, there's three four five six seven apps you need a phone you need an nfc card uh, uh, i think the farmer of the future can't be involved in 10 different schemes with three devices and and uh, so so we're, we're, we're front runners we're piloting we're, we're discovering uh, that's our job uh, to a large extent and then and then later on it has to come to uh, to uh, it has to be consolidated in into yeah the 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 the, the winning the killer apps so to say right uh, um, I, I'm really curious uh, where where that'll lead us, and 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 uh, I hope I really hope that that that'll lead us to a to a to a future where where um, identities are safe, uh, data is uh, fair, uh, um, so that uh, um, the, the technologies we and others develop will indeed lead uh, uh, to inclusive uh, uh, value change and, and not to another big guy owning everything and, and sitting right on top of it. Um, I think that's what we're, we're here for, uh, each, each from our own direction. And, and uh, yeah, if I listen to, uh, to, to all you talk and if I see the questions uh, that, that are asked, uh, that, that stems really positive. Uh, guys, thank you.
uh, uh, this was the last trace talk of the year. Um, uh, the prizes have been handed out. I'm going to eat my chocolate. Um, uh, so so uh, uh, thank you very much and have a great end of the year. Guys, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everyone.